Good morning. Praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Welcome to Victorious Faith. I'm Cherry Campbell. We have been studying the lesson, Proofs That Abundance Is God's Will. Proofs That Abundance Is God's Will. We've been on this now two and a half months. And we are, last week actually, we did look at proof number 14 and 15, which actually go hand in hand. They're intricately connected. Proof number 14, God is love. God is love. And proof number 15, the definition of grace. Grace is the free gifts of God. And love is the greatest expression of love is giving. So actually, grace is the expression of love. Love, the greatest expression of love is giving. God is love. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He expressed his love by giving. The greatest expression of love is not speaking, not saying, I love you. It is action and demonstration of giving and even sacrificial giving. God is love. And we see that in first John four, God is love. And so God is love. Love is expressed in giving the de- That's proof number 14. Then proof number 15 is the definition of grace. And grace is the free gifts of God. And it is the intense desire, passion, joy of God, his heart, his heart beat, his pulse, desire to give liberally, lavishly, abundantly, generously to all universally. And grace is the expression of love because grace is being a generous giver, being gracious is being a generous giver. Now, I had done a series on grace and mercy. It is on my website and on my YouTube channel. You can go to my website at victoriousfaith.co. That's victorious like a champion. V-I-C-T-O-R-I-O-U-S. Faith, F-A-I-T-H dot C-O, C-O like Colorado. And go to the uh, radio broadcast archives page. And you'll find there in the list the series Grace and Mercy. I actually spent more time going into more detail, more definition, more explanation, more scriptural study in that series about grace. And so this last week, I just reviewed that and summarized it. But we see that grace is the giving nature of God. And so that's why proof number 14, God is love, goes hand in hand with God is gracious. And looking at the definition of grace, these that is his expression of giving. So proofs that abundance is God's will because God is love. And because God is gracious, he is a free and liberal, lavish, generous giver. That's the definition of grace. And so let's move on. Let's go to proof number 16. Proof number 16. And again, we're looking at the nature of God. This is another proof looking at the nature of God. Proof number 16, God is good, good, God is good. Now, we have heard that statement quite a bit in the last 20, 30 years. There was a song written by Don Moen, God is good all the time. And people learn to say God is good and then answer all the time. And all the time, God is good. That became a a common saying in the church. But I want you to know, if you didn't know, that back in the 40s and 50s, 
Oral Roberts started saying that. And the church got angry. Particularly preachers, of course, just like in the Bible in the time of Jesus, it was the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the teachers of the law, the religious leaders that got angry at his teaching. Well, it's the same often today. It's not the people that get angry. It's the religious leaders in the church that are so bound in their traditional doctrines that they have a hard time opening up to see light and new revelation. Well, in the time of Oral Roberts, in his uh, crusade uh, era, that he would come out and say, God is good and God is a good God. And the church leaders got angry. People said, leaders said, how dare he say God is good? Why? Because they were indoctrinated with the idea that God is stern, harsh, a harsh judger. It's like God carries a big stick ready ready to whack you. At any moment, you make a mistake. I mean, he's got his bat ready to slam you. And how dare you think God is good? I mean, there was that idea still, God's harshness. God is not harsh. He has never been harsh. Now, his judgments can seem harsh, but he doesn't judge his own children. And judgment only comes on the wicked. And that actually is even, for the most part, delayed, delayed, delayed because of his great mercy and grace. He is long suffering as long as he can be, even with the wicked. But God is not passing judgment on his people. He loves his people. He's a loving father. What we were saying last week, proof number 14, God is love and he's a loving father to his children. So this idea of harshness is not God. It is actually a a lie of the devil painting a picture of God being harsh, stern, judgmental, ready to whack you. That's not God at all. He is so long suffering. He is more long suffering than anybody on earth. I mean, you get impatient, you get upset and irritated with people in probably minutes or hours or days of dealing with things. God has never run out of patience. Never. He is so long suffering. He can sit patiently, peacefully for a million years and not even get ruffled, not even get irritated. So God is so long suffering. You need to get out of your mind any picture of God and your imagination of God being harsh, stern, um, quick to judge and pass sentence on you. He's not. And as a matter of fact, since the time of Jesus, when Jesus was born, I mentioned this last week when we studied grace, because goodwill is one of the definitions of grace. When Jesus was born, the angels declared in the heavens, peace on earth, goodwill Toward man, not among men. There still isn't much goodwill among men. Not until there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth and Jesus sets up his kingdom. There's still sin and Satan. That was not what the angels said. They said goodwill toward man. God has a heart of goodwill toward man. Sinners even as well as Christians. I mean, even we remember it says in Romans 5, 8, and I think we might have read this in our study of love. We did at some point. Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrated his own love for us. And there again, going back to love is action and love is demonstrated by action. This is it. Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You see, that was why Jesus was born. As soon as Jesus was born into the earth, the angels are shouting and declaring goodwill toward man, goodwill toward man from who from God. 
God toward man. Good will, not bad will. He doesn't have bad will, good will. And as it says here in Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. So he demonstrated his love. And even in verse 10, it says, for if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. How much more having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? So while we were his enemies, while we were sinners and enemies of God, he still demonstrated his great love by the most sacrificial gift, sending his son, Jesus, to die for us. Jesus being willing to die for us. And so that is even looking at the word good will. Well, good will that has in it the word good. So let's go on with now proof number 16. God is good and he has good will. His will is good toward man. God's will is good toward man because God is good. And like I was saying, the church has had a hard time with that. Not quite as much in the last 10, 20, 30 years as they did even 60, 70 years ago. But there's still a lot of Christians that struggle with God and their image of God being he's harsh and quick to judge. No, he's not. Once you uh, Jesus died on the cross, he paid for the sin of all mankind and the wrath of God was poured out on Jesus. God sent and poured out his wrath on Jesus. So God's not pouring wrath on you. No. What are we dealing with in this life? Why are there problems and sickness and pain? I've said this for years that I've been on this program. It is because of sin in the earth. It is because of the curse of sin and death that came in the fall of man, the fall of Adam and Eve. If they had never sinned and their descendants, including you and me, had never sinned, there would be no sickness. There would be no poverty. There would be no lack. There would be nothing bad. Everything would still be good. Let's go back to this picture of good. Everything is good. And I had given you one of the previous proofs. Uh, I believe it was proof number 11. The Garden of Eden was the way God wanted everything to be. God wanted everything to be when he created the Garden of Eden. Well, let's look at the description of the Garden of, of actually not just the Garden of Eden, but Creation, Genesis 1. Creation. Genesis 1, 4. We're looking now at proof number 16. God is good. Genesis 1, 4. God saw that the light was what? Good. Actually, if you back up to verse 3, let's read verse 3. God said, let there be light. Actually, the Hebrew is light be. Light was Verse four, God saw that the light was what? Good. God saw that the light was good. Genesis one ten. God called the dry ground land, the gathered waters. He called seas and God saw that it was good. Genesis one twelve. Actually, there again, we need to back up to verse 11. No, let's just read verse 12. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Glory to God. And then verses 16 through 18, Genesis 1. God made two great lights, the great greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. 
God set them in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth, to govern the day and the night, and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was what? Good. Yes. And then verse 21. So God created the great creatures of the sea and every living and moving thing with which the water teems according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was what? Good. God saw that it was good. Verse 25. Genesis 1, 25. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was what? Good. Yeah, good. And then go down to verse 31, the last verse in the chapter 1. God saw all that he had made, and it was what? Very good. Very good. Praise the Lord. And then go to Genesis 2. And there we see the Garden of Eden. We had already studied that a couple weeks ago in Genesis 2 verses 8 through 14. But particularly look at the end of verse 11. Well, let's read the whole verse 11 and 12. The name of the first river is the Pishon. It winds through the entire land of Havilah, where there is gold. Verse 12. The gold of that land is what? Good. Good. And I said this when we were looking at this a couple weeks ago, studying the Garden of Eden. Why does man consider gold good, valuable? Why is it more valuable than copper to man? Why does man like it? Why? Because God said it is good. God told Adam and Eve from the beginning, there is some gold and that stuff. That's good. So from that moment, mankind valued gold. And God values gold. I mean, he paves his streets. Not that he looks at it the way man does, but he uses it. He uses it. He paves his streets with gold and he builds his city with gold. Revelation 21. We looked at that when we looked at heaven. So God considers gold good. And he made the gold and then he told man. Now that stuff, that is good stuff. Gold. Gold is good stuff. Man did not come up with this idea, picking gold out from the silver, the copper, the platinum, or any other kind of ore or mineral, I should say, and say this man did not, is not the one who originated the idea of the value of gold and liking it. God is the one who told man, This stuff is good stuff. Gold is good stuff. That's why we like gold, because God likes gold. He builds. And remember, even in the Bible, uh, in the Old Testament, Moses building the tabernacle and David and Solomon building the temple. God's instructions were build uh, several, make several of the items. Well, actually, the most holy place utensils were completely made of gold. Other things were overlaid in gold. This, the temple that Solomon built had so much gold in it. That was one of the reasons why the Babylonians wanted it. It was gold. They would walk into the temple and see gold, gold, gold. And what was it for? God had instructed them to make his stuff with gold. So God says gold is good. So if God says it's good, it's good. And if it's good for God, guess what? It's good for you too. That's why you can have gold rings, gold necklaces, gold earrings. Yes. If gold watch, whatever. If God says it's gold, 
Uh, God says gold is good. God likes gold. God has gold. It's okay for you to have gold. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So now I've given you the introduction here of Genesis 1 and 2 and shown you God called everything good. But let me back up. I usually do this first, but I am going to do it second. I'm going to back up and tell you what is the Bible definition of the word good? Because let me show you this in modern English vernacular. Good is an okay word. So, so moderate, mediocre, because in our scales of rating quality, most of the time, you go to um, sell a car and or sell something else or you're looking at buying things and they're rated for their quality with stars. Good is usually the lower end of quality. Mediocre. It's all right. It's OK. Not bad. Mediocre. And then we have above good, we have better. And then above that, we have what we call best. The best. This one is good, but this one's better. And this one over here, this one is the best. So the best is the top is highest quality, top highest quality. Well, that thinking when you read the Bible is going to give you the wrong picture of God. That is absolutely not what good means in the Bible because, and particularly looking at the Old Testament, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. The New Testament was written in Greek. Let's look at the Hebrew word translated good. It's the Hebrew word T-O-W-B. Taub, I think, is the pronunciation. T-O-W-B. As a noun, I'm going to give it to you as a noun and then as an adjective. The noun is perfection. In other words, perfect. Adjective would be perfect. So stop right there where we say good, better, and best, and best is the highest quality. Good is mediocre. In Hebrew... The word good means perfect. Let me start with the adjectives. I like that. Let's go to the adjectives first. It is perfect and excellent. Perfect and excellent. Beautiful. Rich, prosperous, and wealthy. Notice the very definition of good in the Hebrew, right at the top of the list, behind perfect, excellent, and beautiful, comes these descriptions, rich, prosperous, and wealthy. Rich, prosperous, and wealthy. Bountiful. It means loving. Now, these are the adjectives. Lovely. Lovely. Loving and lovely, pleasant, delightful, pleasant, delightful, joyful, happy, beneficial, fruitful, precious, sweet, honest, honorable, and right. Now, I'm going to give this list to you again, and I'll pick it up tomorrow and give it to you again. But I want to quickly go through all these so I don't get stuck. I want to finish. Let me give you now the noun. It is perfection and excellence. Perfection and excellence. It is beauty, prosperity, pleasure and wealth, happiness Joy, it is also graciousness, favor, virtue, and rightness. 
praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And so I want you to see, and as I'm going to give you, let me go ahead and actually give you this scripture now. Good throughout the Bible, but especially over and over again in the Old Testament, is a word that describes God. It describes God. Psalm 119, verse 68. You are good, and what you do is good. Now, with that verse, Psalm 119, 68, how can you ever give the definition mediocre? Okay. All right. Good enough. To describe God. God is not mediocre, all right, or good enough. God is perfection and excellence. So when you see in the Bible, good describes God. As a matter of fact, also Psalm 107, 1. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord for he is good. How can you say God is mediocre? No, God is perfection and excellence. So everywhere you see the word good in the Bible, it is talking about perfection and excellence. It is the highest grade, top highest quality. Glory to God. Well, I'm out of time. Join me tomorrow. And remember, God loves you. You're blessed and highly favored by the Lord.